Here's Memphis, here's Canada, okay? Fled to Canada. First, James O'Reilly, after killing King, and by the way, looked into that a lot, and it's all in the book, and so did Congressman Stokes, and, and, it, and it's a 99% chance that Ray pulled the trigger, and if he didn't pull the trigger, you know, he was there as a spotter. So, I mean, Ray was up to his eyeballs in this. So, James O'Reilly, on his way to Canada, took a little detour. He detoured 450 miles south to Atlanta for a few hours. And, and he abandoned his car eight blocks from Martin Luther King's church and office. So it seems crazy enough to drive back to Atlanta when you're trying to go to Canada and crazy enough to abandon your car near Martin Luther King's office at a housing project also near the state capitol, which is swarming with security because our racist governor, Lester Maddox, feared that, that the minority citizens might storm the state capitol as they would have been you know, quite <laughs> just in doing. But... But so I mean, it's a crazy place to abandon your car. But here's why he did it. Because the place where Ray abandoned his car is halfway between that auto plant and Ray's rooming house. Ray came to Atlanta, called Miltier's associate who worked at the auto plant. The guy was working, assembly line, couldn't get off. He had Ray call Miltier directly, who was in town for the Friday collections. Miltier wrote to an associate, fortunately, and said, yeah, I was right in that neighborhood when Ray abandoned his car. I was right there. And so, in all probability, it was Miltier that took Ray the three miles to his rooming house because the FBI couldn't find any cab driver or bus that had, and then to the bus station, and then Ray went to Canada, on to England, on to Portugal, back to England, where he was finally caught. And so, the FBI didn't kill King because if they had, they wouldn't allow James or Ray to be on the run for two months. A horrible embarrassment to the FBI. So, that's, I'm going to wrap up my talk now, and you've been a great audience. Thanks for putting up with all this, probably longer than you expected, and I'll take a few questions, whatever we've got time for. has a question. All right. Hi, I'm Ronald Blyer. Um, I've been so convinced for more than a year now that LBJ um, was responsible for all three, uh, including Bobby Kennedy, that it's hard to take some of this in. Um, you give me, a, you know, a lot of food for thought, stuff that I didn't know, and I, I haven't really gone too deeply into the research, but to kill, uh, just stopping with uh, JFK, wouldn't you need to control the Secret Service the, and wouldn't you need to control uh, the Patsy, H Oswald? Oh, sure. Well, let me, let, me, let me try to answer each of those as quickly as I can because we looked into all those. First off, Oswald was a low-level U.S. intelligence asset from, from the word go. He, the Warren Commission said he was a teenage communist. But ask yourself, how many teenage communists joined the Civil Air Patrol and not only joined the United States Marines, but joined the Marines, try to join the Marines a year before they're even old enough to? So, no, so Oswald, Oswald one of, and, as you're reading the book, there were like five people supposedly defected to Russia around the same time. They all came back with Russian wives. The goal of that operation was then to see how the KGB would then hopefully, to the CIA and, and, and Naval Intelligence, try to recruit either the Russian wife or Oswald. That's why after Oswald comes back, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Oswald, who had been a very public defector, uh, is allowed to get a job at a f map firm in Dallas that makes that helps to make maps from U-2 spy plane photos. You know, no no government in the world is crazy enough to let a real defector do that. But if you want to make your fake defector look attractive to the KGB, 
<laughs> you give them that kind of job. But no, so Oswald was a low-level intelligence asset, There's a, and he was under tight surveillance by naval intelligence from the time he returned to the United States. But again, Oswald is naval intelligence through the Marines, Marine intelligence, not CIA, though he is working with some CIA operations. Oswald, as you'll read, was one of several low-level CIA assets that were uh, assets that the CIA was charged with getting into Cuba before the coup because we didn't have uh, an embassy there, which is where the CIA usually has all their agents operated. So we needed to have people to get into Cuba to both help with the coup and even just to report on how the man in the street in Cuba was reacting to the coup. So that's what Oswald, from a lot of evidence, thought he was doing that day, was going to Cuba. And in fact, the Fair Play for Cuba patsy in Tampa, a guy who is almost Oswald's age, fairly similar physical description, but was actually from Cuba, uh, and, and had also associated with Fair Play for Cuba, that gentleman, after that assassination plot failed, went to Dallas, then to Mexico City, and did go into Cuba. So that's what Oswald thought he was doing. As for the Secret Service, any vice president can tell you, vice presidents don't control the Secret Service. In those days, you didn't have to control the Secret Service. In, in that very tape you mentioned, you can see JFK, whether it's in Tampa or when he arrives at the airport in Dallas. I mean, he's just going out and shaking hands and going right up to the fence. I mean, that's what politicians did in those days. So in other words, the Secret Service, I mean, th there's what you have in the rule books and how government really operates. The Secret Service, when you go back like Tom and I did, and you look at all the other motorcades that haven't been put under the microscope, you see all the same things. I've seen that tape where JFK, for those of you who haven't seen it, lands at Love Field, and, and the Secret Service agent from the car behind, and one, one guy's going to you know, get on JFK's car, and he's like waved off. But that was at Love Field. They were going to be traveling at high speed, and so you didn't need a Secret Service agent on the car. So again, I would encourage you to go back and look at all the other motorcades, and you'll see, yeah, the Secret Service was doing about what they always do. As for Lyndon Johnson, two important things. Well, one, most of you are hearing about Chicago and Tampa for the first time. See, so this wasn't some sort of a Texas deal. I mean, you know, they didn't keep JFK's body in Texas for the autopsy. <laughs> they got to Washington where Bobby controlled it. Uh, JFK was hated by the Dallas power establishment. If you go back and, 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 and research, as Tom and I tediously did, Back in 1960, during the 60 campaign when LBJ was running for vice president with JFK, LBJ and, and Lady Bird were attacked in the lobby of Dallas's nicest hotel, the Adolphus Hotel, by some of Dallas's finest citizens who were right-wing conservative reactionaries. So LBJ was hated by the power establishment in Dallas because LBJ was considered far too liberal on civil rights. And finally, and like I say, there's zero evidence LBJ had anything to do with the assassination, but one of the most telling things is that last shot, the horrible fatal head shot, which many people think came from the rear, others think it came from the front, but, but at least one shot did come from the rear because JFK did have a back wound six inches below his collar. So we, one shot was fired from the depository. So, but if you look, LBJ, I mean, that shot traveled you know, not 20 feet over the top of LBJ's head. So it's like, you know, if, if you're going to arrange an assassination, I mean, I mean, if somebody had stumbled on that gunman and jostled him, you know, somebody in LBJ's car could have been shot. So if you're going to, you know, you don't, so you don't have your gunman shoot right over your head. So like I say, there's simply, and Tom and I looked, we looked hard and we talked to all the people that said, we got the evidence that was LBJ and simply, simply said, none of it holds up. So I, again, I would encourage you to, you know, to, to look at all the evidence and, 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 and think about, you know, LBJ didn't control Chicago, he didn't control Tampa, and he couldn't get them to keep these assassination plots out of the newspapers. That was JFK and Bobby that kept that stuff out. So, but, but again, thanks for the question, because th those are points that a lot of people raise, so I'm, I'm very glad you brought them up. I got, I got two questions real quick. Number one, the first thing is, it, it, it's just it's amazing to me that with all the people and the players involved, even the way the press ran back then, that it, nothing ever came out in this realm. Oh, oh, well, and I'm not discrediting oh, it at all, oh, oh, but it's just, it's just well, fascinating. Let, let, let me actually add something that I didn't mention. Okay. 
So the Tampa attempt to kill JFK, kept out of the press at the time, one article appeared the day after JFK's murder. You know, because, in other words, JFK was the guy keeping out of the press. He's dead. One small article Was appeared. that the lady who saw it on the, on the street and tried to get it to her? No, no, no. We're, we're, we're talking, and uh, this is about the Tampa attempt. Uh, did, did appear in the press, and, and, and Tom and I found that article. And 